Nobel Peace Prize winner Elie Wiesel is here. For more than 40 years, he has helped to preserve the memory of the Holocaust in the effort to prevent future atrocities. As a respected thinker and author, he is often looked to as a moral authority and a voice of wisdom for some of the world's most difficult questions. With his new book, Conversations with Elie Wiesel, he offers his insight into a range of these issues, including religion and politics, nationalism and capital punishment. I'm pleased to have him back at this table. Welcome. I should say this was done with Richard Hefner, uh, Hefner, who many people know because of a program called The Open Mind, which has been on certainly television for a number of years. Uh, how did this begin? Well, it began with a dialogue. It, uh, Richard Hefner wanted me to be on his program to talk. Yeah. And it was at that time, a, to me, an important one because I remember too when he began it some 40 yeah. odd years ago. Yeah. At that time, intellectual conversations, you did not have too many of them right. on, on television until yeah. you came. <laughs> and so you range across to two subjects of Am I My Brother's Keeper, the intellectual and public life, on being politically correct, uh, the state and the proper role in our lives. Well, he chose a subject and we yeah. had usually a half hour discussion and then uh, he collected all of them, those his work really. Yeah. And he listens well, he's a good interviewer. Yeah, he, he certainly had yeah. a good conversation with yeah. I want to move beyond this because it's some of the things and talk about September 11th. Uh, you are for resistant to the idea of saying something good can come out of this because? Because it would almost... No give, matter what the learning is. Because it, it, it could almost give a legitimacy, a perverse, perverse concept of legitimacy to what happened. That we, if we need such a scandalous criminal act to give us food for thought or insight or an insight or a direction that is not good we should be able we as human beings who live in a certain century which is a good century i was you know i, I was so optimistic yeah. at the beginning of the century i thought really it was good the century begins again a new one now we have time to think about it to take a deep breath and say, all right, we shall never do what has been done by others a century ago. And here we are, hardly two years, and once more we are stunned into silence. Stunned by the crime, by the absurdity of the crime. I have studied the theories, the history of terrorism mm. for years. Do you know this is the first time that terrorists are doing what they shouldn't do but did? without explaining why they have done it. They haven't even left a message. They didn't even, they didn't even tell us why they have done it. A, a protest, a recrimination, a demand, nothing. Mm. As if they wanted death to be the message. As if to tell us, you know, you are not worthy of our words. You are worthy of death. Well. Yeah. So but we think of it. But we have, in dialogue between the two of us, we have learned more about uh, where the terror comes from uh, and the misguided sort of intent uh, to create um, conflict. You know, sure. and to then the misguided effort to use religion as a force, showing you the emptiness of their own oh, absolutely. process. I think th those, those, those who use religion to kill, make God into an accomplice. They make God into a murderer. Mm. And therefore, of course, all of us, really all civilized people, must denounce such a method. But you know, terrorism in the beginning of the 19th century was an idealistic, romantic notion. Uh, Dostoevsky wrote a play, a, a novel about it. Camus wrote a play about it. Mm. Uh, it. It means the terrorists, the nihilists, the revolutionaries wanted to kill the governor of Petersburg. Everything was ready. This man was dead. He didn't know it, but he was dead. At the last moment, before entering his carriage, he took his children with him. And these terrorists, hard-necked terrorists, couldn't do it. They couldn't kill children. Today, terrorists don't have this kind of attitude. They kill children and men and women, innocent people, always, always innocent people. The seduction of terrorism is what? for people who prepared to do what terrorists are prepared to do in today's version? It's, a, first of all, an absence of language. They don't need language. Violence becomes a language when language fails. And a terrorist doesn't know how to speak 
and therefore the terrorist becomes a murderer. There is a seduction in terrorism. A terrorist feels superior. A terrorist is one who for days or weeks or years, as it happened here in America, goes around with a secret. And to be a bearer of secrets makes that person different. He or she feels that they are better than us, that they know more than us. They have knowledge about us that we don't have. You also participated in an event about writing. Uh, I'm, you have answered the question before, if you had not become, had not lived the life that you have lived, you might have become what? <laughs> oh, you know, I always think about it, really. Uh, what would I have become? I think I would have remained in my little village yeah. in Transylvania. Right. I would have become a teacher. That was my passion, my passion a, for a learning. A rabbi? Or, uh, uh, yes, a rabbinic, a, a kind of head, a head of Talmudic uh, Academy. And the writer, I would have written commentaries on the Bible, on the Talmud, that was my passion. So here I am a teacher, but I yeah. don't teach that. Yeah. And I writer, I don't write that. Nevertheless. When you, when you began to write, it wasn't easy. Because the emotional charge of what you had to say, what? Charlie, when I began writing, uh, I, I, I felt driven, of course. I felt that if I have survived by sheer accident, when I entered that place, <coughs> I was convinced I would not live a life. Right. I was sure I would die. And here I am, and there I was, alive. I felt I have to bear witness. And for 10 years I was waiting, so I didn't know what, what words to use. And today, so many years later, I still don't know the proper words, the right words to use. The right words that transmit the feelings. More than feelings, the whole event. I have read probably every book about, about that, that period, written by the killers, by the victims, by the spectators, historians, psychologists. I read and read and read, always hoping, or, now I'll understand. I don't, I still don't know. How was it possible that a nation that was among the most cultured nations in Europe and the world could have produced such people? such ideas, to kill a people, my people, and beyond it, other people as well, but mainly the Jewish people. I don't understand it. I don't understand why the world let it happen. What's the closest thing, what has approached understanding more than anything, any other book you have read? Is there one? Is there two? Is there, is there an author? Is there a... I read documents. And documents occasionally are, are of such force that I don't sleep that night. Mainly what I read, and I think I, I think I come close to the event itself, is when I read pages written by children, poems written by children, prayers written by children, children who are almost on their way to the flames. And, uh, an hour later, they, they would be gassed. Why do you think that has so much power? Because of, because it's, it's so, it comes, see, from a, it comes from a heart that hasn't lived a long life. First of all, the innocence. Yeah, innocence. The innocence of children. And also the aborted, the aborted hope that they represent. In doing what they have done, the killers deprived us of their future the future of the children. There might have been among the children a million and a half Jewish children were killed. There might have been among them a great scholar, a great doctor. He, somebody would have invented a remedy for mm. AIDS mm. or cancer. Another one would have written a poem so strong that it would have eliminated all possibility of war among people. Yeah. And here we are orphaned. From those possibilities. Those, possi those promises. Mm. Do you believe your body of work, which is incorporated in terms of ideas and conversations with Ali Wiesel, do you believe that it is of value most important because it doesn't offer answers but questions? I'm not sure it offers anything but que questions, surely. I don't have answers. My passion is a passion uh, for learning and teaching 
and my teaching and my learning really have to do with questions. I teach my students the art of questioning. <laughs> I have not found any answer yet, except, you know, we spoke about it in the past. Yeah. Uh, immediate answers for certain, for instance, the answers of not to be indifferent, which I always believe that one should not be indifferent. And when I, and I, when I phrased it, 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 it somehow caught on. I said that the opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. And I went on, the offer of, edu of education is not ignorance, but indifference. Yeah. And the, offer, the, the, the opposite of life is not death, but indifference. Indifference. So I, I began fighting indifference. Now I'm fighting fanaticism. So that is simple. I know the answer. We must fight fanaticism. The answer is fight. Fight. Indifference, fanaticism. You must fight. You must fight mm -hmm. both indifference to fanaticism and fanaticism itself. Because a fanatic believes that he has all the answers. He has none of the questions, but all the answers. And woe to me, because I have questions. So I am their enemy. One of the things that's in here is, is uh, on capital punishment, thinking out loud about capital punishment. You believe in capital punishment? No, I'm why against not? it. Why not? Why is, why, why is not bringing justice to... <clears throat> You can bring justice without causing death. I would like. I don't like. Is it because of death? death, or is it because you don't want the state involved, or is it because? First of all, because of death. You know, I don't think that we should increase the rea the realm of death. There is enough death in the world. There is the story of the assassination by the Israelis of one of the terrorists, one of their defined terrorists, I who know. they had missed before. Where, do you say to the Israelis that you are wrong? No, I cannot say that. I say it for myself that I feel that uh, for me to take an assassin, who knows, again, who knows who the children or the grandchildren of that assassin could be, which means, again, I'm thinking in, in, to in the totality of the, of, of, of the question. Who knows the future? I don't know the future. But I would say I would take somebody who's really guilty of murder, and I would give him life imprisonment without parole and hard labor. I wouldn't want that that prisoner to live in, a, in comfort in prison, that person should suffer. Yes, that person must suffer because of what he had done. And be prevented from prevented wherever from the forever. evil comes from. But therefore, what you say, state should be an accomplice of death. I somehow have, have a problem with that. Uh, am I my brother's keeper? I mentioned this. The anatomy of hate, uh, nationalism, upheaval, religion, politics, intolerance, capital punishment, taking life, can it be an act of compassion and mercy? making ourselves over in whose image and something that you are so dramatically identified with the mystic chords of memory. Um, this book is called Conversations with Elie Wiesel, Conversations with Richard Hefner of the Open Mind. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, my friend. Good to have you here. Always.